Hello and welcome to the IA School of Thought series with me, Sai Kamal. School of Thought is our weekly show on classical liberal thought, where we look at different strands of thought within classical liberalism, discussing le leading classical liberal thinkers and applying some of these ideas to current issues. The show was inspired by the IA book, School of Thought, 101 Great Liberal Thinkers by Eamon Butler, which as the title suggests, summarizes the thoughts of leading classical liberal thinkers on issues such as politics, government, social institutions, capitalism, rights, liberty, and morality. But before we get started, please do check out all our online content on the IA YouTube channel, IA London. And don't forget to subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin to make sure you don't miss out on any of our thought-provoking and fascinating online content. Today's featured thinker is Walter Eucken, who was a German economist at the Freiburg School and is known as the father of order liberalism. And to discuss his life and work, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague Christian Niemitz, who is the head of political economy at the IA. Christian, thank you and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Okay. Um, you've chosen Walter Eucken to discuss with me today. Can you explain why you chose him? Um, did he have a profound impact on you specifically? Is it because you admired the role he played in shaping our thinking? Is it because you just want people to know more about him? Why don't you tell us a bit about it? Yes, it's more the latter. Um, yeah, Walter Eucken, as you said, was the founder of the so-called Freiburg School of Economics, also called the Ordo Liberal School, or uh, also called the Neoliberal School. There was once, interestingly, a, a school of economic thinkers who actually did call themselves neoliberal. That was long before it became just a meaningless slur, that, that, which is what it is today. Um, the original Ordo Liberals Eucken School were very influential in post-war West Germany, and uh, they had um, a strong impact on the post-war economic architecture. And for that reason, they are widely considered to be the fathers of the post-war economic miracle, which was uh, an amazing success story, an amazing um, liberal success story, you could say. And that's the reason why I've chosen him. The problem, our problem generally is that we don't have a lot of success stories. We don't have a lot of instances where... Uh, a group of economists clearly had an, a tangible impact on economic policies. And this is one of the, the few examples I think of where that did happen in a, in a place where, and at a time when liberalism was really not fashionable and uh, when the zeitgeist was very anti-liberal, uh, West Germany at the time was a very unlikely candidate to, for adopting this relatively liberal framework. And it is because of these thinkers. They were there in the right time, uh, at the right time, in the right place, uh, had this profound impact. And, well, the, the economic miracle that followed from it was their making. Why don't you, for people who aren't familiar with the Order Liberal School, why don't you uh, summarize it in, in, a, you know, in a few words or a few sentences, as it were? Yes, it's possibly easiest to do that by contrasting them to classical liberalism, the old liberalism that they inherited and saw themselves as a, as a continuation of, but also as, as quite distinct. Um, they share with classical liberals the idea that the state should, be, should have the role of a referee in the economy. It should enforce general rules of the game, but it should not be a player. The state should not try to affect the outcome of the game. It should just set a very general framework of rules and then enforce those rules. That's something that uh, the, the order liberal school was, was very fond of as well. Where they departed uh, from old school laissez-faire liberalism was mostly on, uh, well, laissez-faire liberals of, say, British 19th century or uh, laissez-faire liberals would generally have believed that a market economy is not just the best system generally, but also that that is a system which is self-sustaining. It is a stable system. Once you have it, there isn't much that you need to do. Whereas the order liberals um, believed that a market economy, a competitive economy, needed careful management. They believed that it was not automatically self-sustaining and that a market economy left to its own devices could tend towards excessive concentration. And therefore, they were 
far keener on an active competition policy than other liberal thinkers, especially the Austrian school, would have been. That would be the, the, the main point of departure. Now, as always, uh, there, is, uh, there is a spectrum. It, it's not a monolithic school. Eucken himself was on the, the more liberal end of the spectrum. He wasn't far away from Hayek ideologically. And in fact, they are often mentioned together. You could, you could see them as, uh, as at least the part where the old liberal school and the Austrian school overlap. But generally speaking, there, there were then also audible thinkers who, uh, in my view, made uh, too many concessions to, to the state, took it too far away from liberalism. Uh, so therefore, I do not see order liberalism as an improvement over classical liberalism. I would say that their strongest contributions were in the areas where they're not particularly distinctive. Um, Eucken did emphasize the importance of of property rights, of the rule of law, of freedom of contract, uh, of, of free prices that can act as genuine scarcity signals in the economy. Those were their contributions. And there you, you could say, well, that's not particularly distinctive, is it? That's something that uh, you could also say about a Chicago school economist. That's something that you can also say about uh, an Austrian school economist. And that would be true. So. Uh, it, it is fair to say that the, the best contributions they made are not particularly distinctive. But unlike with the other schools, uh, for the older liberal school, you can identify a place where they clearly had an impact on policy, and it then spread beyond that. The, the design of the, the European single market in particular uh, still has older liberal features, state aid rules in particular. That would be very much an, an older liberal idea. The, the, um, the point about open markets, uh, making mean open markets, meaning both uh, making sure that the state doesn't hamper competition, but also keeping an eye on uh, on the possibility of, uh, of of private sector concentration and uh, and and actors within the market um, trying to restrain competition. Now, you say that Eucken and order liberalism in general was influential in this sort of West German post-war miracle. Um, but what about his ideas initially? Um, did he struggle to get his ideas heard initially? Did it take a, a quite a few years for them to sort of percolate through? Um, or did he have an immediate impact? Well, I mean, they, they started, the order liberal school was set up during the Nazi dictatorship, so obviously during that time they had no, they had zero impact on policy. Uh, they they had to keep a very low profile and didn't talk much about policy implications and kept their their ideas fairly general at the time in order to stay under the radar. Um, some of them were close to the the resistance. Uh, Count von Stauffenberg and and his circles of. Uh, of, of anti-Nazi activists and I think that the first time that they put their ideas into something uh, approaching a, a policy manifesto was when they wrote a, 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 a sort of came up with, with ideas for what would happen if the coup against Hitler had succeeded. So that was initially the idea that they did not think of the uh, the West Germany, the Federal Republic that later existed, it, it was initially rather drafted uh, in the event that uh, that the coup succeeds, uh, Hitler gets removed and the generals take over. And uh, that would have been the idea of a, of a, um, of a post-war order. Now that obviously didn't happen. After the war, it was initially, they still had trouble initially, still uh, getting hurt because there was a widespread interpretation at the time, just as in Britain, that uh, the rise of the Nazis was the fault of capitalism. It was capitalism that had led to the, the Great Depression, the world economic crisis, and there was the idea that um, since capitalism was under threat, it took on this more extreme form in a, in a Marxist interpretation. Uh, fascism was is capitalism under extreme circumstances when it is under threat, and and that was still a dominant interpretation. Therefore, 
uh, all the, the two main parties and, uh, and, and some of the smaller ones in, in West Germany were initially in favor of, uh, of a mixed economy rather than a market economy. There were plans to nationalize large parts of the economy, and if, if that had gone ahead, uh, post-war West Germany would have been pretty much like post-war Britain. Where, because Britain absolutely went in that direction, the mixed economy moving away from the market and halfway towards socialism. That was initially the idea in, in, in West Germany too. It was because of Eucken and because of the ultra liberal school and because of their uh, contacts to the future minister of the economy, Ludwig Erhard, that that did not happen. And once their ideas uh, got a fair hearing and became to some extent actual policy, and it showed some some quick initial success, that's when it became entrenched and it became almost for a while a conventional wisdom. But uh, it, it was not that way in the beginning. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the Conservative Party, which was uh, the main governing party in, in uh, the first uh, post-war years, in the first first uh, years of the Federal Republic, was initially also in favor of large-scale nationalizations. When you, when you look at Eucken and his, uh, his sort of, you know, his philosophy and his thoughts, um, do we know who inspired him or who influenced him? You know, either contemporary um, thinkers, but or maybe ancient thinkers as well. I know that he was in close contact with Hayek. Um, they knew each other before the Freiburg School as such was a thing. Um, how much of an influence that was, I, I, I don't know, but at, at the time they were also involved with, with the setting up of the Mont Pelerin Society and um, they were very much part of that crowd just had a difference in emphasis, which is why they were then called uh, a different school. But it very much overlaps with, with Hayekian thinking. Uh, it's, we unfortunately don't know how Eucken's thinking would have evolved over time, because that he died in 1950, uh, meaning that, uh, first of all, he could not really witness the, the post-war economic miracle. It, uh, it, it was only in its very early stages at the, at the time. And um, with post-war Western policy moving into a more interventionist direction, it, it could well be that, uh, like Hayek, he would have become a more radical liberal thinker over time, or it could be that he would, would have gone along with other older liberals and making greater concessions to, to the state. That would be an interesting counterfactual, but we don't know. And what do we know about Walter Oiken as a person? I mean, do we know about anything much about his family life or, you know, the way he lived, um, his, you know, his various jobs? That I don't know much about, just that he came from a family of academics and um, he was not originally a liberal. He, uh, and most, most liberals... Uh, were initially socialists for, for a while. I know that you were, I think I was a, a sort of too. That's the, the conventional trajectory. Uh, he came more from the nationalist right. Uh, certainly his, his uh, members of his family, and I think even he himself for, for a short period uh, during the Weimar Republic uh, were members of the, the German National People's Party, which was an ultra-nationalist party. They uh, wanted the old empire back and they were staunchly anti-Republican. Towards the end of the Republic, they actually moved so far to the right that it, it overlapped quite a bit with the Nazi party. In fact, they were the, the coalition partner uh, of, uh, of the Nazi party in, for the first half year. So then all, all parties got banned, even them. Um, so he did not grow into liberalism. He, he was not a, a natural born liberal. I think... I think it started um, towards the the end of the Weimar Republic and certainly the rise of, of Nazism and then them centralizing power, taking over the universities. That would have been something that uh, that that would have put Eucken off. Uh, he he then became one of the people who defended academic freedom to the to the extent that that was possible without getting yourself arrested, without getting yourself into trouble. And um, that was what, what he did at, at the time. So not a, not a natural born liberal, but um, 
yeah, shaped by the experiences of the time. And, and that also explains some of the, the emphasis of the, of the older liberal school, this uh, strong anti-trust, anti, um, strong emphasis on, on, on competition policy is, is something which to us maybe sounds, seems a bit strange. We are more accustomed to the idea that actually competition is a tough weed. It's, uh, it is quite hard to sustain a market-dominant position for a long time. The Weimar Republic, however, had that issue with cartels and monopolies. And um, there is the, the, an idea that that, is, that was part of the problem and contributed to the, to the downfall of the Republic, the rise of Nazism. That's something that must have shaped him and, and uh, certainly explains much of the the emphasis of the older liberal school. Now you spoke about some of the uh, legacies, if you like, uh, you know, state aid, competition policy, uh, particularly at the EU level today. Would you say it's probably his uh, biggest legacy or, or best known legacy of his thinking? Or are there other legacies that you can point to? Um, well, it's, uh, let's put it that way, for a lot of people, the uh, the experience of the or the, the folk memory, even if you have no personal experience, uh, the folk memory of the this rapid post war recovery is something that made the country generally more pro market than it otherwise would have been, and that must have influenced the neighboring countries as well. That uh, you had this relatively successful economy there in, 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 the, in the middle of Europe and uh, in comparison more interventionist models didn't look too good. I think that is more the legacy but that would not be something that you would specifically attribute to Eucken. That was certainly my experience. I went through a, a teenage socialist phase, uh, who was quite anti-market. This wasn't well thought out. Uh, it, uh, this wasn't thought through at all. This was more the sort of socialism as a fashion statement. Uh, for me, it was a bit of a turning point to learn about th th this post-war development and uh, and ha just how much of a of a success story that really was and the economic policies behind it. I didn't at the time know who influenced it. I, I, it's not that I stumbled across an Eucken book and then thought, oh wow, this makes sense. Now I'm a liberal. It's more that learning about the post-war recovery, learning about how exceptional it was and how unlikely this was to happen at the time. That's uh, something that, that did change my outlook quite a bit. Now, you're I guess I'm not the only one here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you're originally from Germany, now living in London. Um, a, uh, Eucken actually died in London. I think he was given a lecture tour at the time mm -hmm. at LSE. Um, uh, how, how well known is, is Eucken in, in, in the UK and, say, in the US as well? Almost not at all. Uh, and, and that's... Uh, Eucken himself is not... He's not a household name in West Germany either. Ludwig Erhard would be. You would learn about the post-war miracle through the lens of the, the political actors. That's the way I learned about it as well. And that's, that's good enough if you know about, if you broadly know about the policies and about the results, that is good enough that that can, that can turn you into something, someone who is uh, at least not too hostile to the market economy. Um, for, for, but for me, learning about the where those ideas came from that's something that only came much later i i also initially uh, it, it's it's more the figure of ludwig erhard the the minister of the economy the, the one who actually made the decisions um he would be he, he is known in liberal circles in britain and i think in the us as well so uh eucken's ideas are you could say so translated through that political actor, to, through the political figure of Lupe Gia. When When classical liberals uh, look back at Boykin and his work, um, uh, and, we look upon, and we look upon his ideas in a, in a sort of contemporary setting, um, what do you think we could learn from him? And if you think about perhaps in the context of you know, post-war uh, reconstruction or post-war recovery, um, clearly we're now going to be thinking about 
a post-pandemic recovery. Are there, there may well be parallels there. Are there particular lessons you think we could learn from Oiken and the Ordo Liberal School? I think liberals generally have learned those lessons. You can, you, you, you can learn about the importance of open markets and, uh, and, and non-interference without specifically knowing about the Ordo Liberal School because that you can get from other schools as well. The problem is more that there's, there are just not enough of us. It's more that uh, the reason why I think it, it would be beneficial if more people knew about, well, ideally the order liberals themselves, but at least the policies that they inspired is that in Britain, a lot of people have a romanticized view of the, the post-war years. There is, for example, a, a, a popular documentary by Ken Loach, uh, Spirit of 45, about the post-war years, because that was also the time when the NHS was founded and, and the welfare state was expanded. And there, there is a general narrative that that was a relative golden age. And I think that is completely the wrong way of looking at it. The truth is that the the post-war years in Britain were a time when, which set Britain on a course of relative economic decline, and which ultimately turned Britain into the sick man of Europe later on. And of course, if you compare the post-war years to the Victorian age or to the Great Depression, then yes, it would seem like a period of social progress. But if you compare it to post-war West Germany, then it looks a lot bleaker. And I think that is the more relevant comparison. That is what, um, what I would uh, prefer to be more widely known, uh, rather than ju uh, just comparing post-war Britain to the worst possible counterfactuals, why not compare it to a more ambitious one? And then the lesson would be, hang on, what went wrong there? Why did this post-war miracle, why did that not happen here? Why not in Britain? Because it absolutely could have. That's the point. If, uh, if the two countries, if Britain and West Germany had had identical policies after the Second World War, Britain would have been more prosperous and, and more successful. Because if, if you look at, simply because of the initial conditions, if you look at uh, the starting conditions, West Germany was, was completely bombed out. Uh, production was down to something like uh, a third or so of the pre-war level. Whereas Britain, of course, it wasn't a great time, but in relative terms, Britain was in, in, had a much better starting condition. Uh, looking at this, if somebody had, if, if somebody had to make a, a forecast in, say, the late 40s, how those two economies would develop, nobody in their right mind would have predicted that by the early 60s, West Germany would have overtaken Britain in per capita terms. But that is what did happen. By the early 60s, West Germany had uh, overtaken most of its neighbors in, in per capita terms and had reached close to 80% of the American level. That's something which uh, m must have seemed as a, as a miracle to people who lived through it, because immediately after the war, the expectation was that it would take generations or at least decades to even just reach the pre-war level again, uh, never mind moving beyond that and becoming the, the economic powerhouse uh, of, of Europe. And that is something which absolutely could have happened in Britain as well. Uh, Britain had better starting conditions with similar economic policies Britain could have had all the success that West Germany had and more. So it is completely wrong, this, this narrative that the post-war period was somehow a, a, a golden age. Um, it should really be seen as a, a, a massive historic mistake that was, that was made at the time. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this success that, that you saw in post-war West Germany, Austria to a lesser extent, that's something that should have happened here on the British Isles. So in, as we come to the end of this discussion, it's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, how, uh, if someone said to you, um, that's interesting, Christian, you, you've chosen Walter Eucken. Why don't you sum him up and sum up his thoughts uh, on, on auto-liberalism in a few sentences? Ah, uh, well, I guess that's, uh, that's the sort of question that, that every interview partner hates. Uh, it would... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're doing your job. Um, it, yeah, that... They had Eugen outlined what, what he called the the constitutive principles of a, of of an economy where he had a, a checklist. I don't remember all of them, all of the entries, 
but it, it certainly did include the uh, the importance of a free pricing system, of of open markets, no impediments to competition, of uh, the protection of of private property rights, rule of law, predictability. That was a, a major theme for them: the, the predictability of economic policy, uh, minimizing uncertainty, so that economic actors can 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 plan and be, and be certain that uh, the legal situation in, in, in the future is, is something that they can predict and, and, and make plans for. Um, and a stable monetary policy, that was something that was, that was clearly influenced by the, the experience of hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic. You often um, read about how nowadays when there's conflict at the European level about monetary policy with uh, with, with uh, traditionally Germany being the monetary hawk, uh, you often hear the, the explanation that that is uh, because of the experience of, of the Weimar hyperinflation and that that, that uh, brought Hitler to power. Well, that's not true. That's, uh, nobody remembers it really in that way. It's the influence of the of the ultra liberal school. The, the, their emphasis on uh, on monetary stability and uh, a, strong, a fiercely independent central bank, which has which focuses exclusively on price stability and uh, which, which has no other mission. That, that is an ordo liberal uh, legacy. That is the heritage of them. That, that's, uh, that, that's something they advocated at the time. It went into the institutional design of the Bundesbank at the time and later in more and more indirectly the European Central Bank. So in, in, in that sense, their legacy is still, is still around us. I would just generally say that uh, as I said before, the the best contributions they made are not particularly distinctive. You don't have to get that from the order liberal school. You can also just be a Chicago school economist or an Austrian school economist or a public choice economist and still come to those conclusions. And where they were more distinctive, those were the parts that uh, that that I consider more problematic, uh, certainly debatable. We now know that. It isn't true that uh, that a free market economy leads to something resembling perfect competition in, uh, in this textbook introductory economics model, where you have lots of small players, none of them having any any influence on what happens in the market, all of them being being price takers. Uh, that that isn't something that we necessarily observe. There are various sectors in the economy that show varying degrees of concentration, and that isn't a problem. So that's something where uh, I would also say we shouldn't see the order liberal school as, as in, in an uncritical way, that that is something where they made excessive concessions to, uh, to, to statism and state interference. And nowadays it's, it's rather the, the problem is uh, rather that uh, competition policy is often too activist and uh, we often panic too easily. I remember when, when I moved to, to Britain 13 years ago, a lot of people were panicking about the market power of Tesco. Uh, a lot of people were saying Tesco is going to take over the whole country, and uh, they, they they are so dominant. We have to do something about this. This now looks ridiculous in in hindsight. Tesco has has lost several percentage points of of its market share since then, and is has been loss making for for a while. Uh, so, um, but that's that is the the, the sort of um, being overly cautious about competition policy that an older liberal might have shared. I don't know about Eucken himself, but certainly some people who uh, would, would call themselves older liberal might also uh, have fallen into that camp, that they would have looked at Tesco 13 years ago and, and would have thought, oh my God, what do we do? There's this market uh, dominant company and it's, it's so terrible. And uh, well, I'd rather say we, we should have some faith that uh, as long as market entry is, is not... Um, as long as the market is open and and contestable, um, never mind. It's not a problem that you have big companies from time to time and, and even a market dominant position. As long as that uh, the market is sufficiently open and there's no reason why that position of that company should become entrenched. So it's, it's a mixed picture. But yeah, if I if I had to to sum them up in one sentence, uh, it it would really be I guess. Uh, they thought of competition not just as something that is efficiency enhancing, but as something that limits power. That is the main um, 
one of the one of the main terms that they came up with competition as a was one of those German words that, that you can't translate, but an instrument that deprives people of power. That was one, one of his key themes. Good competition isn't just efficient, it's there to make sure no actor in the economy can become too powerful. Uh, spreading power, limiting power, that is a key orderable theme. And that's a valuable lesson and a, and a, and a wonderful legacy. Um, Christian, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been fascinating learning more about Voltoiken, but also about the uh, the, the Ordo Liberal School. As, as you say, not many people in Britain know that much about it. We may well have heard the phrase, but we didn't know much about it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, also, thank you uh, to you for watching or listening. Uh, for more information on our publications, our webinars, and our other online content, please visit our website, www.ia.org.uk. You can check out our YouTube channel, IA London. Uh, you can uh, listen to our podcasts on Podbean. And you can subscribe to our IA Daily Bulletin to stay updated on all our activities. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, see you soon. <laughs>